When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Bowshield wasn't satisfied with any of the bike lubes on the market, so they engineered their own. Their research proved that none of the Teflon, silicone, or synthetic formulas held up when exposed to dusty, dirty, and muddy conditions. For that reason, Bowshield T9 is designed to offer long-term lubrication and protection in any environment. Bowshield T9 waterproofs your bike chain, lubricates cables, and prevents rust with its effective all-in-one formula. The paraffin-based lube flushes out dirt and old lubricants, displaces moisture, and penetrates moving parts. Then it dries to a clean, continuous wax film that performs better than Teflon and lasts up to 200 miles. Bowshield T9 is designed to resist picking up dust, dirt, or mud, which makes it a good choice for all riding conditions. This month, Bowshield is giving away a free prize pack to a lucky listener. Go to singletracks.com slash Bowshield to enter and visit Bowshield.com to learn more or click the links in the show notes. Hey everybody, welcome to the Singletracks podcast. My name is Jeff and today my guest is Rebecca Rush. Rebecca is a seven-time world champion in cycling, adventure racing, and cross-country skiing events. She's a best-selling author and a passionate community activist. She's also an Emmy Award winner for her documentary, Blood Road, which highlights the problem of unexploded ordnance in Laos and her Do Good Foundation, which is working to solve that. Thanks for joining us, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you got your start in adventure racing and you actually have a national and international titles in other events like skiing and whitewater rafting and orienteering, of course, mountain biking. So how did you develop this love for the outdoors and ultimately competing in the outdoors? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people who know me now think I've been a cyclist my whole life, but um, I haven't Um, done a lot of other sports and it started with cross country running in high school was my first uh, Mm. involvement with team sports and, and group athletics and, and racing. But even as a kid, I was always the kid who would camp out in the backyard and wanted to kind of see what was around the next corner. And so I think, I think I've always had this exploratory nature and it's just taken some different formats, whether it's kayaking or, or rock climbing or, or riding a bicycle, which is the most recent iteration. But yeah, I think I was sort of born with a little bit of a wandering soul and that curiosity for being outside. And I've definitely been lucky to be able to shape my life around, around those different sports. But, but yeah, I'm not just a mountain biker. I run and I ski and I do a lot of other fun things. And I think that that's been part of the longevity of, of me being able to stay in sports so long is that I've done a lot of different things, yeah. Um, but they all have, have the same theme of exploring and, you know, pushing yourself. Yeah. Well, do you, I mean, is it, is there something about the outdoors too, or like, are you just as stoked to be like exploring a city or like a, you know, a different environment? You know, I love to travel and, and I, yeah, I love to, to venture around in cities and look at art and architecture and things like that but I'm I'm most at home in the a wilderness sort of an atmosphere outdoor atmosphere I just I think I'm I don't know born to be outside and and so yeah I definitely trend towards you know I live in Idaho because it's you know got the most public land of any other state other than Alaska and mm-hmm. so yeah being outside is definitely a therapy and, and a church for me and and a place that I feel most at home. Yeah. I feel really out of place in the city. And if, <laughs> if you saw Blood Road, the scariest part of the film was, you know, when we finished the ride, we started mm-hmm. in, in Hanoi and finished in Ho Chi Minh City. And, you know, if anyone has traveled in Southeast Asia, you know how busy the cities are. And that was the only time I was scared on the whole 1,200 miles of the Ho Chi Minh Trail was oh, wow. going into the city <laughs> and having a bunch of uh, scooters and everybody else around. Yeah, that's interesting because, yeah, a lot of people who aren't mountain bikers are probably, uh, I don't know, imagining themselves like being out in the wild on their own. Like that's scary to them. But yeah, for you, it's kind of the opposite. It's like being in the city and around, a, you know, a lot of that stuff that's that's unusual. I think it's, you know, when I'm out 
on my bike or out somewhere on my own, you know, or, or even with a small group of friends, other than mother nature, you know, I'm kind of in control of the situation or, and I prepared hopefully and have equipment and an escape route and a plan. Whereas, you know, when you're surrounded by a whole bunch of other people and, and, you know, and this happens, unfortunately with road cyclists and, and motorists, you, you know, in those sort of congested situations, you're at the mercy of somebody else's actions. And, you know, that's the part that's kind of scary to me. Yeah. <laughs> so Rebecca's private Idaho is a gravel event that you've been hosting since 2013, I believe. And over the past seven years, you know, gravel riding has really exploded. So why do you think so many riders are connecting with sort of this scene? It It is kind of cool. Gravel is like the new black and people <laughs> are like, it's a new segment of cycling. I'm like, well, it's not really new. It's been around since, you know, since bikes before road ride, you know, since bikes were invented, people have been riding on dirt roads and paths and things. So, um, it, this sort of like revival of this form of cycling is really cool. And I launched private Idaho really to invite people here and show them, you know, the beautiful back country of Idaho and, and I think the people, the reason people are resonating with gravel is a few things. One, it's, you know, off the beaten path and exploratory and, you know, in our sort of technology laden worlds, you know, we're never unplugged. And, and I do think that you're seeing this trend with people who are going to national parks or going camping, they're, they're going bike packing or, you know, going other places. I, I think gravel is an element of that too, is that people want to get off the roads. They want to go exploring. Mm-hmm. They want to see you know, they want to explore on their bike. Um, and I think there's sort of this worldwide phenomenon happening and you're seeing that represented in cycling, which is really cool is people are, it's not as interesting perhaps to go around in a circle on a course that, you know, (laughs) you know, and I've done that too. 24 hour racing was really inspiring for me for a while, um, to go around in a circle on the same course, but now, you know, me and a lot of other people sort of want to go to point to point and, use cycling as a discovery, um, you know, not just of how hard they can push, but also of, of what is over that next hill. And so, and I think that that's a really great, great way to invite people, you know, into the outdoors is on a dirt road. Mm -hmm. The the other reason I think people are getting involved is that it's not intimidating. You know, there's much less of a intimidation factor than there would be perhaps for somebody new getting involved with mountain biking, you know, a wide open, smooth dirt road, um, is accessible to almost anyone. Mm -hmm. So I, I think for those, those two reasons, people are are really coming together on gravel. And what I love is that it's bringing together mountain bikers, roadies, totally new people, pros, like every spectrum of cycling is finding something that they like on gravel. And Mm -hmm. that's pretty great. I think. Yeah. I mean, that's really cool. I've, I've heard you like describe this before too, how, gravel is unique and it's really important i think for cycling in general because it does kind of bring everybody together and it's like all skill levels and everybody can enjoy it and it's safe and it's fun and you know all ages and yeah i think you you really articulate that well and and the event itself really reflects that thank you yeah it's a big melting pot you know a bunch of people riding around on two wheels yeah So on your website, you share some equations that you've worked out over the years. And one of the ones that I read that I think a lot of mountain bikers can relate to is blood flow equals brain flow. (laughs) So how does riding play into your own mental health? Yeah, these equations, you know, they've been developed over the years. And and really, it's the last few years where I've been, been able to kind of articulate one of the big questions that people ask me for when I do ultra endurance sports, it, the question is why. <laughs> and um, so those equations have really been able, you know, I've been able to kind of explore that question myself because I never really had a good answer before. <laughs> and the brain flow equals, or the blood flow equals brain flow. That really kind of came to me when I was writing my book. And it was the first time in my life where I was really sitting at a desk for prolonged periods of time. And mm. Writing and and creativity is the one thing in my world where just trying harder and putting your head down and hammering away doesn't produce a result necessarily. You know, as an athlete, I was sort of trained that you just work harder and the result comes. But 
I didn't find that equation was working when I was writing um, a book and I'd sit there and stare and and try hard and nothing would come. And my dog, I like to say my dog Diesel actually really taught me this because he'd come in and put his head on my lap and basically make me take him outside for a walk. And then I started to realize if I, if I walked around and, or rode around, you know, on the bike path with him, with my bike, that suddenly the problems I was trying to solve in my head, um, the the answers started coming to me when when I was moving, and it was a a revelation that your brain, you know, to be active, you know, blood needs to be flying through it, and I think a lot of athletes have found this, and they call it in a lot of different ways. You know, you might call it for runners, it's you know, getting into a flow state or runner's high or something like that. But to me, I became really aware that what I've been doing on the bike all along is a form of meditation. Yeah, I started doing still meditation after I came back from Blood Road the first time, and started to realize that that same feeling is what I feel. You know an hour in on a bike where I lose track of time and suddenly like, you know, there's a sense of euphoria and everything seems okay. And all the problems that you were sitting at your desk, you have answers for them. And, and so that's really what that equation is representative of is that the more we move our bodies, the the healthier our minds are as well. And it took me not moving and sitting at a desk or trying to write a book to really realize what I was missing, that, that I've had my whole life, even as a child, you know, running around outside. And there's a lot of adults, too many adults that, that lose that movement in their world. And, mm-hmm. you know, for our mental health, our physical health, you know, our emotional well-being, I really do believe that being outside and movement and sport in whatever form that you take is the magic pill for all of us <laughs> yeah. it's right there waiting for anybody and it's accessible to anybody yeah well how do you know when like you haven't been riding enough or you need to go for a ride or you need to get outdoors like how does that manifest itself are you you like start to feel angry or like tense or like what what's kind of your trigger where you're like okay hold on i need i need some blood flow here yeah i mean i notice it in frustration with you know maybe i'm a little snappy with you know, coworkers or people I'm working with. And I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm just not myself. I'm not happy. Um, and that can represent itself in how you reflect your attitude to other people, or you get pissed at somebody who cuts you off, you know, at the grocery store, or, <laughs> right. you know, or your shoulder, suddenly, you know, your body will represent it your shoulders are, you know, up around your ears or your back feels tight. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are all your body sort of screaming out to you being like, Hey, you're not taking care of things here. Go out and go for a walk. And I really do believe that partially, you know, why dogs are so healing for so many people is that they actually force us to go outside and take them for a walk. And so, yes, pets are, you know, they're fuzzy and lovey and, and they're amazing to have around. But I really think the biggest thing is they make us they make us take a break for at least a couple of times a day. You're like, oh, I have to walk the dog. Yeah. And, but really we're walking ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. So if you don't have a dog, get one or just go out in a morning walk with your coffee or, and, you know, and, and it's as simple as that. And, it, and I, you know, I sort of have a rule when I'm walking my dog or, you know, I, I don't use my phone. I'm not, you know, I'm present in that moment of just mm-hmm. going outside and, and looking around and taking a breath. Yeah. So do you have like a mantra that you use when you're doing a particularly long or grueling ride? Like, are these equations kind of, are you turning them over in your head or or is there like a go-to sort of thing that you tell yourself? Yeah, I've had a few mantras over the years. My, the very first mantra I ever used, and this was a high school running coach taught it to me. I didn't even know what a mantra was, (laughs) Um, but I was sort of struggling on the cross country running team and we were heading into state meet and I'd had a really bad race at regionals and, you know, at at high school at that age, you know, that seemed like the most important thing in the world. And I was, you know, really nervous going into the state meet that I was going to let everyone down and I was going to have a bad race again. And, you know, he, uh, he just said, you know, your brain can only fit one thing. And so I, all I want you to do, just don't even think about anything, but just say this, these words and just run. And it was, um, I can, I will, I won't be denied. 
Oh, and wow. I remember that. And I just like chanted it to myself the whole time and ended up <laughs> finishing all state, our wow. team won the state meet. And, but it was very interesting that, you know, at that young age to learn that, yeah, there isn't space in your head for more than one voice at a time. I mean, we all have voices, but, you know, we can choose a positive one or a negative one. And and so, yeah, I have used mantras over the years, quite a few of them. And, and really, you know, my main mantra now coming off Blood Road and, and the words that my dad used for me in his letters home from the Vietnam War, he signed all of his letters with the words, be good. Yeah. And that's become, um, you know, the name of my foundation and, and sort of my mantra and and to me, be good can be interpreted in a lot of ways of being good to yourself, you know, being good to the environment, being good to people around you. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the main one. But yeah, I'll say stuff to myself all the time. And <laughs> and I do talk to myself like, come on, Rebecca, or, you know, try to say nice things to myself instead of bad things to myself. Right. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the term flow state. And I mean, particularly on a lot of the rides that you do, I mean, these are, these are multi-hour, sometimes multi-day I imagine. So what do you think about for hours on the bike? You can't be like in flow state that whole time. So what do you kind of like fill your head with? There are a lot of different strategies. I mean, I'm just heading to the Iditarod next week. So I'll be, I'll have a lot of time in my head (laughs) in the Alaskan wilderness um, (laughs) here really soon, but it's kind of a mix. I mean, sometimes, you know, if I'm racing really hard, you know, I'm doing math calculations. And so, which I'm not very good at math. So this is good. It takes up a lot of time. You know, if I'm traveling, okay, I'm going 12 miles an hour and I have this many miles left to go and it's been this many hours, you know, when will I be finished? And Mm -hmm. I go round and round in my head like that and try to figure out. And then I do sort of food calculations of like, okay, if I have seven hours left and I have this many calories left and I spread it out per hour. So I, I do some of that sometimes, but then a lot of times, you know, I'm looking around at the scenery or I'm, I'm you know, thinking about if there's a, a rider in front of me, you know, if, if I'm in a race, I'm thinking about race strategy and getting to the checkpoint and being organized in my head, you know, okay, when I get to the rest stop, I need to do this, 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 this. So there's quite a bit of like planning that's happening while you, while I'm on the bike, especially for an expedition type of thing. Like, where am I going to get to tonight? How many hours am I going to stop to sleep? So I'm strategizing a lot. But then there's times, yeah, where I am just zoned out. And I, the Iditarod Trail is a really good example. I usually, when I'm going somewhere, I like to read and watch films about that area. And I've done that mm. from my adventure racing days. You know, like when I went to Australia, I read this book called Fatal Shore. Huh. And, you know, just I, I like to kind of immerse myself, especially if I'm on a famous trail like the Iditarod Trail. And so, yeah. you know, I've been like reading Jack London and <laughs> like getting into my head that way. So I'll be out there sort of having, you know, especially in really long events, you know, it's sort of a hallucination state where, you know, you lose all sense of time and you're thinking about some weird poem or, or a song or something. Um, I sing to myself a lot. (laughs) Last year in Iditarod, I was literally howling with the wolves because I was alone for days and these wolves were howling. And so I joined in there. (laughs) I do take audio books sometimes on really, really long rides and I'll save those for the nighttime just to help keep me awake. Yeah. But I'm not always with headphones in my ears. I don't I don't like to do that the whole time. I really just kind of save it as, you know, it's a crutch, you know, when you're when you're falling asleep and so mm. I'll save some music and book books for for really long events like that. Yeah. Well, that's a lot to think about, but I mean, these are these are long races. Well, there's a lot of time, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, is it becoming more difficult to find new challenges for yourself? To a lot of observers, I'm sure it seems like there isn't anything that Rebecca Rush can't do, but <laughs> but there has to be, right? Oh, there's, I mean, Alaska is a really good example because I, when I went, decided to go last year, you know, I'm, I'm for anyone who knows me, I'm, I'm really pathetic in the cold. And I always swore I would never do a winter bike expedition. I'll never climb Everest. I don't ice climb because my body just really isn't suited to it very well. And it didn't appeal to me. Um, But for some reason, um, I think you're kind of hitting on something. I hadn't really challenged myself in a while with the kind of commitment that, you know, Alaska took. A self-supported bikepacking event in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness. Yeah. 
requires an immense amount of commitment and uh, reliance on yourself. And after I did that, I realized, I mean, I was terrified and scared and my only goal was survival, which I did. Um, (laughs) But I realized coming back from that, that I really missed the expedition type riding like that. And, you know, the last time I did something big like that was Blood Road and riding the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that was commitment in a different way. But I'm realizing that well, to answer your question, you know, bike expeditions are, are where I want to go. Long, intense, famous trails around the world and, mm-hmm. and immerse myself in the history and the current events there. Uh, but your, to your question, you know, is it hard to find a new challenge? And absolutely not. I mean, if you look at my career, it's like I started as a runner, then I was a rock climber, adventure racer, kiker, and then even cycling. It's, you know, 24-hour racing, 100 milers, stage races, yeah. now bike expeditions, gravel there is so much to choose from. And, you know, when people say to me, like, how do you pick? Or, you know, I'm kind of bored with this or that and the other. I, I don't really, if somebody's bored with something, it's, that's a, a, a way to tell themselves that it's time to pivot. Mm, yeah. You no. Know, and maybe you want to try a triathlon and maybe you want to mix it up because if you love sport, which a lot of people do, or even if you love being out, outdoors, maybe the delivery system might get boring. Like say you hike the same trail, you know, you've done it for the last 17 years, every day of your life. Um, I could see how that gets boring. And so hike it backwards, you know, right. and suddenly that's going to change the scenery and, and you're still hiking, you're still on the same trail, but it changes things. And so, no, I'm not bored at all. If anything, I wish I had more time in my days and years to like do more things. Like, there's so many places I still want to go and do, but I have realized in those equations that we talked about on my website, I have realized that by articulating what I stand for and what's important to me, those equations really help me choose because there's too many fun things to do. And so I do have to say no to some things. And so I have to look at, you know, is there a risk involved? You know, does this excite me? Mm -hmm. Is there a sense of adventure in it for me? Is there a sense of giving back? You know, and if I'm checking all those boxes, then it's it's a yes. But the last, probably the last five years, I've neglected this sort of Rebecca adventurer box because I've been working really hard on the film and the film tour and and growing my business and growing my event. And so this year and last year has been a real sort of return to one of those equations that I had been um, yeah. I've been neglecting for a little while. And so that's where the bike expeditions are coming in now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you hit on it too. I mean, I think like everybody, we're all limited in our time and it's like, you can do a week long race and then you could do a two week long race, but eventually you're going to run out of time. I mean, you can't, you can't always be racing. So that's really interesting. So have you faced any challenges that were too big for you, at least at the time? And and how did you deal with the failure in that situation? I mean, I've failed a bunch. Yeah. I mean, it's a prerequisite for success is failure (laughs) and screwing up and getting up and dusting yourself off and trying again. So, so yeah, I I fail all the time. And I think partially I just touched on it a little bit, me really returning to training and having a coach and setting myself up for some races and expeditions more seriously is because I had been failing in the last few years of like working too much and focusing too much on my business and neglecting myself. And like you said, I was becoming, you know, how do you know when you're not getting outside enough? I was becoming kind of a jerk to be around (laughs) and, you know, touting that like everyone should get outside and do these great things, but yet I wasn't doing it myself. And so Mm. I was failing and finding that balance with my business and my work And also with, you know, my riding and my personal time. And it's a little bit intertwined because my business is revolved around expeditions and the riding I do. But um, I wasn't doing enough of the getting outside part. And and so that, you know, recent lesson is learning to ask for help, learning to ask for advice, learning to say no to things. You know, that's the last equation I have on my website is less equals more. (laughs) Um, and, And saying no so that I could actually do the things I am doing better. Um, so yeah, I've, I've failed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your be good foundation. You kind of touched on it. Uh, be good was how your father signed off his letters to you and your family. What's sort of the group's mission and, and how are you carrying that out? 
Yeah, Be Good was really launched after my ride down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You know, I found the place where my father died. I was able to ride the whole Ho Chi Minh Trail. But it was really an eye-opener of, you know, I found a part of myself and a purpose that I didn't really know was there, that I that I could use my bike and my exposure for something bigger. And I really do feel like those were his instructions to me. And And so the genesis of the Be Good Foundation, one of the biggest surprises riding the trail was to learn that there are still a lot of unexploded bombs all along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And each year, people in Laos and Vietnam and Cambodia, and Laos especially, um, which is where my dad was shot down, the trail is littered with unexploded ordnance and unexploded bombs. And it's, you know, villagers are threatened every day and people are, die every year from it. And so I got attached to that mission and, and started to, you know, feel like my my dad, who was dropping bombs there, brought me there to show me that this problem still exists. And so I launched the foundation initially with the goal, and this is one of our main projects, to help clear up the unexploded ordinance along the Ho Chi Minh Trail so that the people living there can live a safe and peaceful life. I mean, there are children there who were, weren't alive during the war, and they've never known, they've never known you know, a safe backyard to go play in. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy if you if you think about it that way. And so one of the big missions and the founding sort of genesis of Be Good Foundation is to is to clear unexploded ordnance along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And I use the the Blood Road film, um, and I'm still showing the film. People can host the film, and that's that fundraising goes towards cleaning up those bombs. Um, I have bracelets that are made from bombs that are cleared. Yeah, I have one of those. Yeah. Those are really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And and it's basically our trash is, you know, turned into something beautiful and memorable and made by Lao villagers. And and so I use the film and the bracelets um, really. And I do a mountain bike Laos trip every year where I take a small group back and ride a portion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And those are all fundraising towards towards clearing the, the unexploded ordinance there. But the other missions of the, I mean, basically the mission statement of Be Good is to use the bike as a catalyst for healing and evolution and empowerment, whether it's a, in Idaho, in Ketchum, Idaho, or a village in Laos or somewhere in Africa. And so the other sort of facets of that, Rebecca's Private Idaho has always been a fundraising ride and that goes through the Be Good Foundation as well. And the focus of that is is access for people to be able to ride bikes. And so we support World Bicycle Relief, People for Bikes, and also our local high school cycling league and our local trails organization. And so Private Idaho is all about providing access for more people to be able to ride a bike um, wherever you live. And then the sort of the third tier of the Be Good Foundation is helping protect public lands and the places to ride bikes. So, you know, I've, I've done quite a few projects that, that bring awareness to our shrinking public lands um, and the fact that if we don't have these outdoor spaces and these churches and, you know, places where that are therapeutic for all of us and essential for our health and wellness, um, once they're gone, you know, and we're all stuck inside or, or in a city, um, I think the world's going to be a, a pretty scary place if that happens. And so, so yeah, there's different projects with the Be Good Foundation, but it's really all about using my bike to heal and help support communities. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that, that the Blood Road film and sort of that expedition was the catalyst and, and it was kind of unexpected. You didn't know that you were going to come back with this sort of mission. I mean, was, was it completely un- unexpected? Um, was that, or was that something you were thinking going into, you know, doing this project with Red Bull and that, you know, maybe, maybe there would be something more to it. Or I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, did the project change for you? Like what you were going into it to do versus like what ended up happening? That's a great question. And you, absolutely the projects changed. I mean, I went in as a you know, as an athlete with this eye on nobody's ridden the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I want to do this bike (laughs) expedition. And then there's a personal family, you know, discovery aspect of it Mm -hmm. for me. And, you know, those were very personal. I don't want to say selfish, but they were, they were things about me. I want to do this ride and I want to find this place. And probably, you know, halfway down the trail, it, it became really clear that, that it was, a lot bigger than just me and just my interactions with Huan, my Vietnamese riding 
teammate, with, with the film crew, with my husband, with the villagers along the way, it became really apparent that this ride was just the beginning of this whole story. And the ride was five years ago. And what has happened since then was a big surprise in launching a foundation and, you know, really pivoting a lot of my work into adding a philanthropic element into pretty much every ride I do. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've met so many people through the film tour, whether it's, it's Vietnam vets or people who've lost a family member or people who are learning to ride a bike, or it's become so apparent that the bike is a healing tool for people. So I feel like I've become a little bit of this. I know it's a healing tool for me and blood road was very much healing for me, but now all of that has really expanded far beyond me. And that's pretty special. And it's really exciting and, and was very unexpected that my career would really blossom in this way from this one ride that was personal. And now it's, it's become, you know, a global mission. And, you know, I've basically connected with this entire family. I didn't even know I had yeah. um, of people that are, that are finding healing and strength and on the bike or, or in the outdoors. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you won an Emmy for it. I mean, it was, it was <laughs> incredibly compelling and yeah, unexpected and real, right? I mean, yeah, it was not a scripted film. It it was happening in the moment exactly as it was. And yeah, I definitely had like tears in my eyes and yeah, a lump in my throat, like watching a lot of those scenes and yeah, very dramatic. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a gift. It's been a wonderful gift. I, I, you know, it is my dad's basically, my inheritance from my dad is, you know, he's, he's teaching me and guiding me, um, mm -hmm. at this point in my career and, and my life, even though I don't, you know, I didn't really ever meet the guy, um, in person. Yeah. That's incredible. So another one of these equations and a core value that you have listed on your website is passion equals payoff. So I'm curious to know if you ever made like a conscious decision early on to pursue your passion with an eye toward this payoff or did it sort of happen more organically over time? There was definitely a decision when I decided to leave a really great job, you know, I'd open some, uh, uh, chain of climbing, climbing gyms in California mm. and was, you know, the part owner, business manager, and decided to sort of leave that dream job and, uh, head into my car, <laughs> go live out of my car and go rock climbing and, be a dirt bag for a while. And, and so, yeah, I did, you know, make a conscious decision that, you know, I need to be outside. I want to go exploring. And, and I left behind, um, what a lot of people would have said was, you know, the best job in the world. Yeah. And that really did that decision to sort of drive away from Los Angeles in my Bronco, you know, with towards Moab or wherever, um, that really did sort of create this string of decisions that were, you know, on paper might have been irresponsible or directionless or I don't know, but yeah. And I, I didn't try, I didn't sort of start that adventure lifestyle. Um, thinking, Oh, I'm going to become, I'm going to do this, then become a professional athlete. The, the equation was not clear. It was a very circuitous journey, but hmm. it was a choice of, I know I can't live in LA. This place doesn't speak to me. Yes. I have an amazing job but I got to go and see what else is out there. And it was sort of the, the risk of staying was bigger to me than the risk of going. Um, and that's kind of what I talk about with passion equals payoff. And most of the times we don't know what the payoff will be. There will always be one. It just may not be the one that you thought. And blood road is a great example of it. There was immense payoff for me, but it has blossomed into a very different payoff than the one I thought I was going to achieve. Well, yeah, I mean, clearly you're an inspiration to so many people for so many different things too. I mean, you know, even just, just the idea of like quitting a good job and like pursuing a passion, I think a lot of people, you know, wish they could do that or they've thought about doing that, but you know, clearly you're, you're an inspiration. Thank you. I appreciate it. But you know what? Honestly, it's like I'm just doing what feels right. And people will ask about taking these kinds of risks and things. And honestly, it's, you know, I always had a backup plan. You know, when I moved in my car, I didn't owe any money. You know, I didn't, you know, I could always get another job. You know, wasn't really, yes, it was a risk, but, but I had, I had my bases covered, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. 
Well, you're known to many as the queen of pain. Mm-hmm. Is that a proper description of who you are or who you feel like you are? Or does that nickname ever sort of bother you? It doesn't bother me. I think it gets misinterpreted a little bit. And I <laughs> was on a podcast recently um, and Rich Roll asked me, you know, what is your relationship to pain? And some people look at it as like, you know, you're hurting yourself or they look at ultra endurance or, you know, some of the events I do are extreme suffering, physical suffering. And the answer, you know, I didn't have an answer at the moment when he asked me that, but then I went back and thought about it and really pain is my teacher. Hmm. You know, when I go do a really long event or do something that's really hard or write my book, which was very painful um, because it was really hard. I learned something about myself and, and what I'm capable of doing. And so pain is often a dirty word for people, (laughs) but if you really think about the things that you've done worthwhile in your life, um, they were hard Mm -hmm. and it required sacrifice and commitment and pain and suffering. And you got through the other side, a bigger, better person with, something, maybe a child or a house or a new career, or you did a 24 hour race. And so I think it is an accurate description for those reasons. Um, sometimes I, I, you know, I like to call it the queen of perseverance (laughs) instead of maybe the queen of pain, but it really is about putting yourself out there and sticking with it and knowing that, that pain and suffering, you know, is a teacher. And, you know, that's an old sort of Buddhist philosophy as well. It's nothing new. I didn't make it up. Yeah. But people will keep, always ask, why do you have to go flog yourself? Why do you keep <laughs> doing more? You know, when is enough enough? And it's not to say I don't like to sit on my couch and have like a comfy, you know, pillow and down comforter in my bed. I love those things. But I learn the most when I'm pushing myself in places like Alaska or the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yeah. Well, the way you describe that saying, you know, pain is your teacher, it's almost like a like a role reversal. I mean, it's like you're the student of pain. You're not the queen of it. Like you're, you're learning from pain. Yeah. And I, the reason I keep going back is because I'm, maybe I'm a poor student, but I'm still <laughs> learning <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Very cool. Well, clearly, as I said, you know, you're an inspiration to many inside and outside of the sport, but I'm curious to know who are your heroes? Like who have you looked up to along the way? And and maybe who are you currently kind of looking to, to, to see where you want to go or who you want to be? That's a good question. I mean, I've tried to look at, you know, sports figures or people who've, you know, created sort of businesses out of what they love. You know, Laird Hamilton is somebody that comes to mind who's done a really good job of that as maybe not necessarily a hero, but maybe a teacher of like what is possible with your sport and your passion and how does that look? But really is when I think of heroes and and this is sort of a, a newer, you know, after riding Blood Road, it Our heroes are the people that are around us every day, you know, Mm. my mom, my sister, my dad, the the ones that are having an impact on our lives that we we don't even realize until we're much older and we look back and be like, yeah, mom took us camping every summer. (laughs) And to me, she's a hero because of that and because that really shaped my life. But, you know, when you're young, you just look at like, you know, you look up to famous figures as heroes but I'm starting to realize more and more that our heroes are are right in front of us if we if we kind of open our eyes and open our ears. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's really powerful. One of the things that I've been reading recently are studies that seem to suggest that uh, women may have an advantage over men in ultra long distance competitions like <laughs> running and cycling and things like that. I don't know if you've seen any of this or read any of these studies, but what do you think about that? Like, do you think winning is is a part of biology or is it like more than just our biology or our gender? You know, it's fairly document, well documented that the longer an event gets, the smaller the gap between the, the, the time difference between mm-hmm. an elite female and an elite male. You know, in a mile race, for example, the gap may be a certain percentage. Mm-hmm. But as you get to a marathon or ultra marathon or, you know, multi-day running race you start to see some of the overall winners are women yeah and so the longer it gets um the smaller that gap gets and then eventually especially in swimming and some other really ultra long events um 
the gap goes away and women are actually more suited yeah. toward, <laughs> toward that. And swimming is, is especially, is especially one of those, um, ultra endurance swimming, uh, many of the records are held by women, um, which is, is kind of cool. And, and partially that's physiology. And, you know, I don't, I'm not touting myself as a science scientist or anything, but there is something to be said in ultra endurance swimming about women's physiology is, is built for it. Um, perhaps better than, than men. Yeah. What I, what I do, you know, I can only really speak from my own experience because I'm not a scientist, but you know, the adventure racing that I was doing, those teams were always co-ed and typically one female and three men. And so I raced a lot in seven, 10 day races alongside with my male teammates and they would be faster than me the first three days. And I'd be hanging on for dear life, basically <laughs> with my tongue on the ground saying, I can't do this. This isn't going to, this isn't for me. They need to find another teammate, <laughs> you know, a lot of self doubt, but then sure enough about day three, um, the tables would start to turn and we'd equalize. Hmm. And then towards the end, often you'd see the women in the adventure races carrying the guys packs and being the stronger ones, um, at the finish of the race. And, yeah. and I saw that firsthand in my Self, and I, I saw it in my other female, you know, competitors that I raced with, where the guys were super strong in the beginning, and then often the woman was the last one standing. <laughs> wow. I think some of that has to do with with pacing. You know, that women physically can't go out as fast, mm -hmm. um, and I think in ultra endurance events that pays off because you you save yourself. You know, you don't burn all your matches in the beginning. I saw it in the Leadville 100 all the time. I was never a fast starter all these guys, all these guys be charging in front of me, charging in front of me, you know, and then sure enough, about halfway through the race, you know, I'd be picking them all off and <laughs> passing them. And I, and I, somebody said to me once, this was one of my favorites. He's, he asked me, he's like, Rebecca, why do you start so slowly? <laughs> and my response was just, well, why do you finish so slowly? Because really it's what happens at the finish. And I do think women are, are a lot better at pacing, um, perhaps in men, and it does pay off in, in, really long events if you have the patience for it yeah but so much of this long stuff is also mindset and attitude and how you're dealing with, with it in your head not just in your legs mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's really interesting so this year you just added live and giant bicycles as a sponsor so which bikes are you looking forward to riding this year well i'm really excited i, t I have been able to um, ride the peak peak advanced 29 um, over in laos on the ho chi minh trail so i had a like a really good 500 mile test ride <laughs> on yeah. that bike through the jungles of Laos on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and it was super fun. And I also just rode that at the um, 24 Hours of Old Pueblo and ripping around in the desert there. And it's such a fun bike for kind of all around, you know, cross country endurance riding, the kind of riding that I do. And it's a ton of fun. So um, that's been the main bike that I've been on so far. It's it's a brand new relationship. And then you know, of course, we'll be riding gravel bikes with them and looking at, at, um, kind of expanding the horizon. Um, I'm excited to actually help them with some bike development and some product development. And so there's a lot of cool opportunities that I'm really excited about to work with them. And I got to go out to their offices a couple weeks ago and, and I came away, you know, giant is the biggest bike company in the world, mm -hmm. which was kind of crazy, but I came yeah. away from spending time at their offices in the U S sales meeting, feeling like it was the smallest big company in the world. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it because it felt like a really small, tight knit company, you know, that, that was much, seemed much smaller than they really are. Interesting. And so it's kind of the best of both worlds of having the reach and the assets um, to be able to do some really cool projects, but to work with a bunch of people that still feel like a family. And I haven't seen very many big companies that are able to pull that off in that way. And so they make beautiful bicycles, but even more importantly, it was really exciting for me to feel like I connected with them as people and hmm. that we're going to just do some really cool things together. Yeah, that's awesome. Which bike are you going to be riding in the Iditarod? I'm actually riding a fat back in the Iditarod, which oh. is a bike, um, a fat bike made from, made in Alaska, an Alaskan company. Mm -hmm. And that's because Giant does not yet make a carbon fat bike. So, right. Yeah. The Yukon is not. A... Yeah. And so they've been actually really open with, you know, that 
you know, you need to ride the bikes that are appropriate for the, the big expeditions that you're doing. And I appreciate they, you know, they didn't force me into, to, if they didn't have the bike available, you know, they didn't force me into riding something different for, especially for an expedition like this. Yeah. That's very cool. So what are your goals for 2020? We've got the Iditarod. What else are you looking at doing this year? For events, um, I've got the Iditarod on my calendar, um, Dirty Kanza 350. Um, I've got two Rush Academy training camps that I've launched, gravel camps here at home. I've been taking off some some bike packing in Idaho and um, putting together some some routes here in my own backyard that, um, I'm pretty excited about because there's, I don't, there's so much here at home. So yeah, I've been exploring with my friend Doom, Steve Fastbinder here in Idaho a little bit. Um, and then I really do want to, um, you know, tick off some more, some more famous trails in the world, you know, like I did Iditarod, like Ho Chi Minh Trail. So I've kind of been looking at Lewis and Clark Trail. I've been looking at Silk Road and just some other, some other, um, bigger bike expeditions. Yeah. Um, so that's to be determined. Um, <laughs> yeah. And of course, private Idaho is coming back this year. So that's a big part of my summer, but yeah, I don't know. I'm like the first half of my calendar feel for this year feels like it's filled out. And the second half is, is not yet filled out because there's, there's too many things to choose from. So I have to decide. Yeah. And I'll definitely be going back to Laos in December. I go, I go there every year on, and do a big ride on the trail. Oh, cool. Do you like having sort of some flexibility in your schedule like that? Or, or are you someone who likes to just have everything planned out and, you know, know what you're doing for the next year? I like the flexibility. I mean, it's been the beauty of the, the disciplines that I've chosen. You know, if I were a World Cup cross-country racer, for example, you know, your schedule is set four years in advance and you're working towards the Olympics and, you know, you know exactly what day you're going to be doing what. And there's definitely a, probably a nice rhythm to that where, you know, the decision-making is taken away and you just know what you have to do. But I also feel like I enjoy being able to pick and choose and Mm -hmm. be like, oh, I want to go to Scotland. I wonder if I can find a cool (laughs) race there. Or, you know, I'm really inspired to go here or there or do something in Idaho. And Mm -hmm. so I do enjoy the flexibility. It, it probably makes it harder for business planning and, and things like that. But I, I like being able to have the creativity to do the style of riding that I want to do and find the places that, that I want to do it. And I'm really grateful that my partners, you know, like Red Bull and Liv and Giant are allowing me to make my own choices as it's, it has allowed me over the years to build my brand and, and my career in the way that I wanted to build it. Instead of being told what to do, I'm able to create what I want to do. Yeah. And yeah, you've clearly done a lot of really interesting and different and exciting things. And yeah, I know, I know we all enjoy watching you and and seeing what you're going to do next. Thanks. Well, next I'm going to Alaska to survive (laughs) with all (laughs) my fingers and toes. (laughs) Yeah. Good luck with that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us, Rebecca. We really appreciate it. Well, it was fun talking to you. That was awesome. Well, you can learn more about the Be Good Foundation and keep up with Rebecca at RebeccaRush.com. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week.